Hi, welcome to Detours, Understanding Acquired Brain Injury. And today we're going to be talking about one of the most common types of injuries you'll see with acquired brain injury, uh, frontal lobe injury. And unfortunately, it is very common. And the problem with frontal lobe injuries are that they are incredibly disabling. They affect all kinds of domains of ability in a person who suffers them. And virtually every kind of acquired brain injury involves some sort of damage to this area of the brain. Um, frontal lobe injuries may be very mild or they may be devastating. And those of you who know your history from psychology should recognize the name Phineas Gage in the 1840s, the mid-1840s, who was a railroad construction worker who was a foreman on the line. And he was using a tamping rod to pack down a black powder, which they used to blast. And he had the black powder go off due to a spark and it blew the tamping rod through his frontal lobe. And it had radically altered his behavior. And his story is famous in Psych 101 when it talks about the sections about how alterations in biology affect behavior and the linkage and some of the early linkages between how brain function can influence psychology, thinking, the mind, all of these things. And it's basically from studies of people like him, like Phineas Gage, and from others, uh, the, the famous uh, French neuroanatomist who studied uh, Broca, who studied aphasia, who also contributed, and Wernicke in Germany, who studied uh, aphasias and strokes. These folks contributed to our early understanding of neurology and how it affected behavior in the early history of neuropsychology. Um, so naturally, they're of interest to me. And so what I want to do is talk about how damage to the frontal lobe, we'll use the brain here, this section, the brown section, is what we're going to be talking about. And these kind of injuries when are most commonly caused by, in traumatic brain injury, that is, by the, a coup contra coup blow to the head. So if you're driving along in your car and you hit somebody, or somebody strikes you, and your brain is, is thrust forward and back, you often will suffer damage to the poles of your brain to the frontal and occipital region. Um, or if you suffer a concussive blow, a, a, a shaking of the brain, your brain will be damaged in different areas, but in the frontal and sometimes in the ventral or the orbital frontal region as well. And many times in a fall, there is rotation of the brain, twisting and stretching of the white matter, the connective neurons, which are myelinated. See my video on the function of neurons, um, as well as damage to the lateral sides of the frontal lobe also. And so we'll be talking about what impacts to these areas can do and different functions associated with different areas of the frontal lobe. So let's get into talking about the different areas anatomically. All right, now, first of all, you have here on the dorsal, on the dorsal side, the dorsolateral aspects, the right and the left hemispheres, and they function differently. Mostly the the higher cognitive functions, metacognitive functions, are associated with things like working memory. You'll see here and here, which hold information to prepare it for encoding. So when you've learned new information or are trying to figure out when you're looking at the directions in the mall for where a store is, or if you're trying to find out something for your job, or you know, you're, you're reading through the newest memo, or if you're at school and your teacher's explaining the Revolutionary War or whatever, um, when you hold the initial information, you hold it here temporarily before it is encoded in the hippocampus, uh, which is deeper in, and we discussed that in talking about memory. The, this region, if it is damaged, you have trouble holding it long enough, and so 
because you cannot hold it long enough, you are unable then to encode it. And this is one of the areas that is typically damaged and affects memory. Um, and so this is why many patients with frontal lobe injuries describe having memory problems. And this is one of the causes why if you're trying to remember a list or you're having problems with rehearsing something to hold, it's like, oh yeah, I got to write that down. Those kind of things you'll often, if you're distracted, will forget. This is kind of like RAM in, in your laptop or in a computer. You'll be like, oops, I forgot to write that down and now I don't remember what it is. And this is very common in people with uh, frontal lobe injury, they'll forget and have trouble with e either immediate or uh, short-term memory, and it's due to damage to this area of the brain. Um, also, that area of the brain is responsible for metacognitive skills. That is the ability to tell yourself that I'm not doing so well on this task. So when you are concentrating on, say, putting something together or navigating or studying and getting feedback from somebody who's helping you work on a project or if you're preparing for a school test and you're not getting the problems right, a person without damage to the frontal lobes will know, mm, I better go back and study that section again or I better check my work at work because I'm not really getting this. If you have damage to the frontal lobes, you won't get that feedback from, you won't get feedback from yourself that, hmm, I think I need to go back and check my work. Um, you'll think you're doing fine. And you'll even argue with somebody, no, everything's fine, I'm fine. You're not doing fine, but you're not getting the feedback from the system in your brain. And again, that, that typically tends to be on the left side here, which is mirrored, unfortunately, in this one, but in this side, on the left side, which tells you that mm, you're not doing so good. And if there's damage there on the on the left side, um, no. uh, on the left side of the of the brain, telling you oh, this, you need to go back. And so, oftentimes, cues or something like that to help redundancy and tasking also helps uh, patients have problems with this. But this is something that will take time to get better. And in some cases, unfortunately, it just never goes away. Um, and so, you just have to live with the consequences of that. Um, so usually built-in backups, like somebody else to check the work or something like that. In some cases, it's not too severe, and so it is within a acceptable limit. But this is one of the signs. This is how you could tell that somebody's got frontal lobe damage, is if they're exhibiting any of the psychiatric symptoms, like um, anxiety, depression, if they're lacking drive or not willing to do anything, but they say everything is fine, then you know it's more likely due to brain injury as opposed to symptoms from depression or anxiety or something like that. If they'll tell you everything is okay, they're not having symptoms, even though they're expressing them, then you know it's most likely due to frontal lobe injury. And there are those kind of problems that you're dealing with and need to be addressed differently. Um, also, some of the other functions, and these are more on the right side of the brain, um, also frontal lobe, dorsolateral, excuse me, um, here, you see changes in uh, things that affect attention and processing speed, mostly due to white matter injury, um, diffuse axonal injury um, up, up here more. Um, if, you, if there's injury here, the person will have trouble with paying attention, focus. Um, they'll still exhibit symptoms like ADD, ADHD type symptoms. Um, if, you have a, if they have a task in front of them, they won't be able to focus on the papers or uh, the job in front of them. Noises will catch your attention or they'll be trying to pay attention to everything all at once instead of keeping a focus down where it's supposed to be on what's in front of them. They'll maybe be all over the place because they cannot inhibit their behaviors. And this ties also into another major function of the frontal lobe, which is the ability to concentrate and focus on on inhibiting your own behavior, the filters. People with frontal lobe damage typically have trouble filtering behavior too. And that is the ability to no uh, social scene to, to know, hey, maybe in church you shouldn't, shouldn't be throwing around the F word. Um, that um, punching the cop is maybe not a smart idea. Um, that you know, spitting on the floor at a historic monument inside 
get maybe not a good idea um, or taking your clothes off and you know at you know in the supermarket bad idea or groping some random guy when you're married maybe not a good idea and yes there have been cases of that too um, impulse control associated with dysfunction both in the dorsolateral aspects as well as down here the the ventral aspects of the frontal lobe down here which helps us measure risk and riskiness of given behavior as well as to help us determine you know, social rules that kind of thing and know whether we should engage in specific behaviors or not um, kind of like acts as, as the internal conscience if you will it's not quite that narrowly defined but that is the role of that area the orbital frontal cortex and damage here is very devastating and what's kind of interesting is that there are two sharp bones right underneath called the sphenoid wings and if you're in a car accident you end up scraping that area of your brain almost like a cheese grater so usually you see a lot of damage here and which is why you often see a lot of socially inappropriate behaviors out of somebody with damage to this area of the brain the ventromedial area and i'll be talking about that right here in a moment damage to this area will typically be manifested you you could tell that there's injury here one of the signs is interference with a function of smell because uh, the two white areas are the olfactory bulbs um, and help process sense of smell person who's lost that sense of smell and it's not due to damage to the nose or covid um yes i know that that seems to be a taboo word um but in all seriousness damage here a uh, person with injury to this region of the brain will seem to be much more egocentric only their own interests will matter they're not capable of seeing from the perspective of the other very self-centered very childlike childish impulsiveness um they have problems with um they're very, very puerile very um, they they seem to lack drive they don't they really have pro it, it's almost like you're dealing with a kid like with dealing with a a, a young child like a five-year-old a person who has damage here and rehabilitating that is very difficult um many times we use the antecedent behavioral consequence technique in order to help them um so you look for problems that crop up before they become an issue you learn what kind of things would set a person off with these kind of injuries um people with damage there tend to be much more aggressive and a lot more um, likely to have difficulty anticipating what kind of events are coming up and what might set them off so they're they're easily triggered as well um, so damage here is can be very devastating um, and really it makes them pretty much unemployable um, and means their social relationships tend to fall apart quickly and they have trouble really with any kind of relationships in the future so um damage here has to be remediated most people with severe enough damage end up custodial um they either are become they're either end up being wards of their parents uh, and then eventually end up in a nursing home or long-term care facility because tragically there really isn't much we can do for that um, again we can try to anticipate what kind of things will get in their way um, to prevent them from having behavioral issues but sadly there really isn't much to help now damage to other areas we can do more for it um, and I don't mean to sound so negative but unfortunately because of all the social functions controlled by the ventral area the orbital frontal cortex it makes them unable to socially function in the end and a person who cannot function socially isn't really a member of society sadly fortunately most legion lesions to this area are not quite as comprehensive as some uh, people with severe traumatic brain injury and extensive damage to this area are um, kind of left out but with minor or moderate they may have specific isolated deficits and workarounds can be found but if it's extensive enough it, it has a very it, it may have impact on sexuality it may have um, effects on well, 
may have impulsivity when it comes to to speaking. They may just say whatever's on their mind, um, no matter what the consequences are. And many people with this kind of serious damage end up in the prison system um, because they don't know where the lines are. And it's just, um, as I said, probably the most devastating aspect of any form of traumatic brain injury would be damage to the um, orbifrontal cortex. It also impacts the ability to anticipate risks, too, on top of all of that. Uh, so that's that. Now, there are other areas which have other impacts, too, damage to the frontal lobes also. For example, there's the medial prefrontal cortex. This area, whoops, this area here, which traces up. The medial cortex helps with high, some high, slightly higher level function. That relates to our ability to know the mind of the other. Again, really important. The ability to anticipate what somebody else might do based on past experiences. It has connects, deep connections, white matter connections with the hippocampus. And so our ability to understand and access our own, to access our own memories. Gee, the last time, you know, I used that nickname with this really sensitive person, they got mad. So maybe I shouldn't do that. And so accessing those memories is important to, you can anticipate. Or, hey, last time I complimented her, uh, she liked it. And so maybe I should do it again. And so those functions are related to theory of mind, the idea that other people have a mind and that I can anticipate by running the simulation, in effect, in my brain through the deep connections across the cortex, including into the hippocampus for memory, as well as the higher functions of the parietal lobe and those areas that control the more intellectual functions are operated here, as well as those functions which are associated with social motivation and drive and uh, the ability to imagine the other and to empathize with the other. And so dysfunction here obviously would cause that kind of abulia, that lack of will, that lack of drive, that kind of thing that renders many patients with, with injury to this region kind of a couch potato. The abulia is that it's not laziness. And this is important to understand. A lot of times when a young person gets this and their parents are like, you just lay around the couch all the time. It's not intentional. It's important to understand that you that the drive, the energy, the get up and go does originate from within the brain in this area. And if you don't, if you can't generate that initiate that behavior um that that is also one of those things that really fundamentally alters the way you can interact with society and also can be very devastating it looks almost like depression like what are called the vegetative symptoms of depression but again if you don't notice it or say this is a problem it suggests that there is damage to the frontal lobe and so it needs some treatment. And the good news is we can do something about this. And one of those treatments is things like Concerta or methylphenidate, which is short acting formulation of methylphenidate. Um, and that's one of those drugs that has shown effectiveness in dealing with attention, focus, some of the metacognitive skills, as well as things like abulia, that lack of will, that lack of drive. And so, yes, for this, we can do something unlike damage to the orbital frontal region. Finally, I want to talk about or the dorsolateral aspect um, here and the right dorsolateral. This is where I was injured. Um, I suffered some injury here. I told you I'd been in two motor vehicle accidents. The right dorsolateral aspect helps us with emotional regulation. Um, many people who suffer injury here have trouble with things like emotional lability. That is that their emotions quickly will change from happy to sad to angry and back again. They'll be more impulsive with their t uh, temperament. Um, they'll notice reduced um, the emotional flexibility, emo reduced emotional range. Um, they'll tend to be they'll tend to have flatter affect. They won't show happiness or sadness quite as often, or at least be able to express it. They may feel it, but they can't show it as easily. And that's because a lot of emotional processing is done here.
Also, what's interesting here is that creativity, not necessarily the ability to appreciate, for example, music or art or painting, but the ability to be creative, to pull together, um, to create a piece of music or art is found here in this aspect of the frontal lobe. And so um, damage here can devastate an artist's career. If you're a painter, a musician, singer, whatever, and you have damage here, it doesn't matter whether it's from traumatic brain injury, anoxia, uh, whether it's due to brain swelling from encephalitis or whatever, damage here can end your career um, because it takes away that creativity, the ability to pull together streams from multiple areas because it links together the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe, which is associated with sound and music and processing those things. It, since you can't pull that information together, you can't come up with new and novel concepts and destruction there is just absolutely just destroys. Uh, you might have the mechanical skills, but you lose that ability to integrate emotion, perception, and all those things together. So, Now, the left dorsolateral aspect has more to do with speech. A person who has damage here will have trouble with their speaking abilities, their abilities to pull together much like on the right side with a lot of the artistic creativity, they'll have trouble pulling together their words. They'll have trouble with the ability to produce mm, novel concepts or the ability to uh, find the right word. I have some anomic af aphasia too, which is this word finding ability, but they will have like a poverty of speech. If you ask them to describe, for example, something like this bottle, they will say bottle. And that's it. They won't be able to say this is a, a deep blue container with a black cap and a, a straw on the top with a silver ring about um, about an inch and a half down. And it is it has a screw top lid with an aluminum container inside. They wouldn't be able to do that uh, because they're not able to generate and to pull the lar their, their larger vocabulary together. And again, it's an integrative dysfunction. They also have slower processing typically. Um, again, white matter damage, and they're, they're more likely to experience neuro fatigue as well. Um, so generally, overall, it's a lot more of the standard executive functions. Again, it's that attention and concentration that is adversely affected um, from damage here. And so that covers the major problems when you experience frontal lobe injury. And unfortunately, so much of that we really can't do much for. Um, things you could do if somebody has abulia, trouble with their willpower and drive, you can give them drugs like bromocryptine or amantadine. You can give them, you can use a stimulants to help. Um, you can give them a drug like uh, uh, Aricept, which is used for uh, patients with Alzheimer's. It helps the cognition. It is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And you want to raise the dopamine levels. The frontal lobes are packed with dopamine-based neuro neurons that rely on dopamine production. And so by elevating the levels of dopamine, you can improve some of the cognitive function. However, you don't want to push that too far because you may get psychotic symptoms. So it's a question of balance um, to generate alertness. On and so some of the functions. Rehabilitation is mostly... Um, psychological, psychiatric, and it's focused on helping a person to rediscover some of those skills that have been lost and through exposure and through teaching direct instruction, good old-fashioned behaviorism. You reinforce what can be learned, but unfortunately, in some of those cases, um, once you've taught something, unteaching it or extinguishing behavior is very difficult because they don't have the perception to understand that a stimulus is not going to be, you know, not coming. Um, so it kind of gets locked into a loop. They also have problems many times, uh, dorsolateral uh, frontal lobe injury can cause what's called perseveration, which is to repeat a behavior over and over and over. And it's related to this extinguishing problem. So that's frontal lobe dysfunction. And unfortunately, it is kind of a, a grim picture, which is made worse by the fact that it's probably the most common type of damage. And so usually the best way to deal with it is environmental adjustments to provide a lot of support 
for a person who has the more serious symptoms and to try and anticipate what will become a problem and try to head it off um, before it is a problem and to provide a lot of support and teaching for those things that can be mitigated um, by through um, anticipation, the antecedent behavior consequence model, and through trying to come up with direct strategies to help. There are medications that can help. Um, a lot of the Ritalin, uh, Ritalin and, and Adderall and the anti-ADHD medications uh, for mood stabilization, right dorsolateral kind of treatments. Many times the anticonvulsants are used to stabilize mood. Um, for the behavioral stuff, again, that's mostly environmental modifications, environment uh, mod modifications made at work. Um, if they're even employable, many times sheltered workshops are a good place to start um, to help the more seriously disabled and just lots of love and support. Um, so thank you very much and have a good day.